So I read a comment on one of the other Hilda related videos I've made that said that the best way to watch this show was wrapped up in a blanket with a cup of hot chocolate while it's pouring rain outside. Unfortunately, it wasn't raining the night I watched Hilda and the Mountain King, but I did prepare myself some hot chocolate and made sure to get real comfy on my couch with my dog sitting next to me before I hit play. And I can confirm it is the best way to watch Hilda. I highly recommend it. If you haven't seen this Netflix original cartoon yet, you are doing yourself a disservice. Hilda is a great show and I'm going to explain why the movie that recently dropped, which continues use its story upholds that greatness. Spoiler warning, support me on Patreon, let's go. Right out of the gate, the first thing that struck me about Hilda and the Mountain King, as I'm sure it did for many people, was the aspect ratio. And I'll be honest, at first it felt pretty weird to see Hilda in 2.33 by 1, but after a short adjustment period, it really grew on me, at least for the more dramatic and atmospheric sequences such as those which took place in the mountain caves or the visions that multiple characters have from the perspective of the trolls having their mother call out to them. I think the wider frame does wonders to enhance the intensity of those sequences. The scenes that are less dramatic and take place in settings we are much more familiar with, I can't say the same for, though they certainly don't look bad, and the only reason it ever crossed my mind that it looked ever so slightly weird was because I was used to seeing those environments in 16x9. It's not a bad thing, it just very occasionally caught a little bit of my attention. Regarding observations of mine that anyone would actually care about, while watching this movie, I realized something about the Hilda series that, sadly, I don't think it has gotten any direct praise for, which is its very strong continuity. The movie picks up right where season 2 left off, but since it had been a while since I had watched any Hilda, I actually forgot some stuff that gets touched on in this film. For example, I actually totally forgot what happened to Frida's leg, and I remember having the impression that Eric Alberg was going to have less of a complete control over the city's troll defense organization, but in the movie he holds just as much of a virtual dictatorship over it as he did before. Because of this, I actually decided to rewatch the season 2 finale to refresh my memory of some of the stuff that happened leading up to the events of the movie. And as it would turn out, I was just misremembering Alberg's season 2 conclusion and Frida trips and twists her ankle here. But while I did clear up my slight confusion over the stuff that inspired me to rewatch that episode, I was surprised to find how many other story elements were slipped into the season 2 finale that would become utilized later on. For example, I didn't remember the troll baby basically at all, but there it was, saying Baba the whole time and just generally acting in the same way that we see it acting in the movie. I also totally missed seeing the trolls carting human trash into their mountain. A habit of theirs which we explicitly learn is them creating their own little collections of different objects they pick up which are discarded by the people of Trollberg in that scene of Trilla educating Hilda on troll life. I'm sure some people are raising an eyebrow at the notion that Hilda is praiseworthy because it remembers that Frida hurt her foot in between season 2 and the movie but I would imagine that it's actually a really difficult job to keep track of all the different moving parts in a show, and I've seen what happens when inconsistencies are allowed to build up in a story over a long enough period of time. I mean, hell, overanalyzing Avatar has been pointing out moon continuity mistakes in The Last Airbender for almost a year now. And given all the different magical creatures, each with their own unique way of fitting into the setting of Hilda, I find it especially impressive how strong this show's continuity is. Someone had to remember that the rats who lived down in the sewers underground would be especially disturbed by the troll mother sitting up, so we get to see them in distress during the climax of the film. This kind of attention to detail goes a long way in maintaining the sense that this world that we are watching is alive. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if I were to give the entire series a rewatch and discover the same attention to detail throughout the whole show. However, the degree to which Hilda and the Mountain King depicts a very well thought out and intricate world can be attributed to more than just the extra details that you can afford to miss without breaking your ability to follow the story. That stuff is the icing on the cake, but the cake itself, and by that I mean the core plot points of the film, does just as much work. We have always known that the trolls and the humans were in some sort of conflict. Initially, it seems that the trolls are just savage beasts who the humans must protect themselves from. Then, it becomes apparent that the humans were largely just letting their fear trick them into believing that about the trolls. They overreacted by using bells to keep the trolls away, and the trolls only harbor hostility towards the humans because of the hostility that humans already had shown the trolls. However, in Hilda and the Mountain King, we get a much more concrete recollection of the history between trolls and humans, establishing that the land which Trollberg was built on effectively belonged to the trolls before the humans came in and built a town over it. Amma, the mother of all trolls, erected the mountains that surround Trollberg presumably hundreds if not thousands of years ago, and the humans built a village on the land between the mountains. 
which just so happened to be right over top of where Ama was taking a nap, effectively locking the troll's mother away from them. And this revelation brings so much more meaning to every interaction between trolls and humans in the entire show, because we now understand that there is a reason for everything in this world to be the way that it is. We, as the audience, aren't just being dropped into a universe where humans and trolls live in the same area and they don't like each other because they both feel vaguely threatened by one another. We are shown causes and events which lead up to a world like this, and when you understand how a world came to be, that world starts feeling less like something the writer simply had an idea for and wanted to make a story about, and more like an unfinished puzzle slowly being put into place. This is, of course, assuming that those puzzle pieces actually fit together. If you set up a backstory for a setting and it doesn't make any sense, it'll accomplish the opposite effect than what I'm describing. But obviously Hilda and the Mountain King doesn't have any problems like that. In fact, this movie goes above and beyond in the department of world building by making the building blocks of its world extremely relatable to real life. Human history is up to its ears with recordings of one group of people settling in a land that was owned by another group of people, refusing to leave and generating tension between the locals and the foreigners for generations to come. I am glad that in this film, it is a real possibility that the human settlers didn't know that they were invading already colonized land, unlike our history books. Because I think Hilda works best as a light atmospheric slice of life experience, rather than a vessel for character drama. Evident by the fact that it stumbled both times it tried to generate a notable amount of interpersonal conflict among its main characters. And having the human settlers be aware of the troll situation and still choosing to steal their land is a lot more dramatic than what is, in effect, a series of unfortunate misunderstandings. But it's not like this detracts from the peril of the trolls' situation, or makes it less compelling. Because whether or not the humans were knowingly building on top of Ama doesn't really change what happened to the trolls, it only changes our perception of those humans' morality. Thus, I think it was a really good decision to put the focus almost entirely on the trolls throughout the film, and see things almost entirely from their their perspective. I was actually feeling a little bit clickbaited at the end of Season 2, considering Hilda being turned into a troll is some of the most extreme magic we've seen out of this show so far, and it was basically the most cliffhanger an ending could possibly be. But to my slight surprise, the movie gave this plot point a very valuable purpose beyond simply raising the narrative stakes, and that is giving the audience a perfect vector to empathize with the trolls. For the whole series, we had been learning more and more about how not evil the trolls are, but at least for me, it felt like making amends for how the humans treated the trolls was just a matter of the humans stopping all the bell ringing. But thanks to Hilda being turned into a troll, we get a whole mission trying to turn her back which leads to the discovery of Trundle's eye. Literally his point of view. And by having Hilda experience Trundle's perspective on what turns out to be the years of conflict between trolls and humans spanning back apparently to before the Trollberg Wall even went up, two major things are added to our perspective of the trolls. The first is that they become far more relatable because their story is being told through a character we have already grown to love, and who is now in a very similar position to the trolls. Hilda was yanked out of her home, separated from her mother, and now is unable to try making contact with her without being persecuted by the people of Trollberg. Second, we understand that this wound is still fresh to the trolls. Some of them, it seems, have been alive since before Trollberg was built. To them, it isn't the status quo that a city is sitting on top of this unknowable cause that draws them towards Trollberg. Their mother was something the trolls had which was taken away from them, just as Johanna was effectively taken away from Hilda. And combined with the fact that the trolls can still hear Ama, it becomes apparent that the preconception that just stopping all the bell ringing would solve everyone's problems isn't really true. And when you think of it in that perspective, it starts to seem a little wrong for the humans to pat themselves on the back for making the trolls' situation less bad. And that's why I like that even when the people of Trollberg truly start healing their relationship with the trolls by hosting the Night of the Trolls every year, Hilda makes sure to mention in narration that the tensions between humans and trolls are not resolved overnight. The film is extremely respectful of what the trolls went through, and it understands that it would be unrealistic to pretend that they would just become best friends with the humans even after they started to seriously make it up to the trolls. Wounds take time to heal. But still, Hilda and the Mountain King remains hopeful for the future, suggesting that the next generation of trolls and humans will be able to forge a healthier relationship. And that's a theme I find extremely agreeable, as well as delightfully mature. And that's something I could say for the whole movie, really. This is easily the most adult Hilda has ever felt, and I'm a big fan. Not only because it means the story I already like can explore a wider variety of and more complex emotions, but it also means that Hilda manages to pull that off while still feeling like Hilda. 
And to explain what that even means, I want to examine Johanna's encounter with the two packs of trolls about half an hour into the movie. Johanna tries and fails to make contact with the first set of trolls, then narrowly avoids the second, much more aggressive set. On its surface, this isn't really anything we haven't gotten used to seeing. These characters have been in near-death situations before, but what's different here is that we actually get to see Johanna's reaction to the traumatic shit that just happened to her. We see her genuinely feel despair over losing a chance to get Hilda back, and genuinely feel, holy shit I almost just fucking died, like actually my life was seconds away from being over, when she just barely escapes the troll that was trying to kill her. Again, it's not so much that way more adult things are happening to the characters. That scene of Johanna getting attacked by the trolls even contains this goofy shot of Cedric being eaten in one bite by one of the trolls. That could not possibly make it more obvious that he's not dead and will definitely just pop out of the troll somehow later on. It's simply that the characters are having more adult reactions and attitudes towards the things that are happening to them. It's kind of like the single best scene from Steven Universe Future, wherein Connie's mom basically explains what PTSD is to Steven, to which he recounts all of the incredibly traumatic things that he has experienced throughout the course of the show, and as the viewer, you just go, Oh. Oh god, yeah. That shit was actually really fucked now that I think about it. The following scene of Trilla explaining the almost attack on Trollberg follows through on treating serious scenes with more maturity, though it also gives us an appetizer for the film's abstract and visually striking imagery, which hits you with full force when Hilda gets sucked into Trundle's eye. The scene that proves just how effectively Hilda can pull off trippy and a little bit horrifying sequences, on top of just maintaining the show's insanely high bar for aesthetic appeal. I know I've talked about the presentation of this series, but before, but Hilda and the Mountain King simply had so many shots and cuts that I would kill to have framed on my wall. And it made me realize something. Everyone who makes a video about Hilda at some point compliments the show's visuals. Half the comments I read about it are gushing about how beautiful the show is in every imaginable aspect. There is so much fan art. But you know what? It's not enough. The universal praise Hilda receives for its presentational quality is not proportional to the level of that quality. Someone explain to me why there are no customer reviews on any of these fantastic Hilda posters. These character designs are so simple and readable and versatile, and I mean versatile in every sense of the word. Not only do these designs look fantastic no matter what environment they are in and what they are doing, but also no matter what art style they are drawn in or even no matter what frame rate they are animated in. The environments are some of the best I've seen in any animated product, period. Hilda's color palette and color design is mind-boggling. Even the CGI cars look amazing. They manage to feel mechanical and inflexible while not feeling like they don't belong in the cartoon world they exist in. They look like the golf carts from Gravity Falls, which is very much a compliment. I have no idea how they're doing all of this, but animation teams take notes. And obviously it's not just the visuals, the voice acting is superb, there is not a single bad performance in the entire cast. And I'm really surprised how much Tantu's voice has grown on me. I actually can't find his voice actor, it's not listed in the credits and I can't find it anywhere on the wiki or any other websites. Help. All of the songs that are chosen for the credits fit the vibe of Hilda perfectly, and the background music that plays scene by scene works so wonderfully. I was watching Cobra Kai with my family, and one of the most ridiculous things about that show that I flip-flop between hating and ironically loving is how on-the-nose and unsubtle the music is constantly. I only bring this up as a point of comparison, because what Cobra Kai does wrong, I think Hilda does very, very right. The score underpinning every scene perfectly accentuates the little moments in between otherwise upbeat scenes where a character character has a moment of doubt or sadness without overdoing it. I didn't even consciously realize that music was playing in the background of most scenes, which I consider a good thing. It guided my emotional responses without feeling like it was holding my hand through every single emotion that I was supposed to be feeling, which made my investment in each scene generate so much more naturally. See, the point of going on and on about this movie's production value is not to actually explain why it looks so good. I don't think any one sentence I've uttered in the past two minutes accurately expresses how how much I love Hilda's aesthetic, but maybe the fact that I would just go on and on about it even though I already know that everyone else agrees with me that Hilda's production value is phenomenal, will. Another thing that I think everyone pretty universally agrees about Hilda that I want to elaborate on through this film is, well I guess you could call it the world building? There's a really good example of what I'm talking about in the scene where Hilda asks Trilla if she has a troll dad, and when Trilla responds, no, why do you ask, Hilda just says, No reason. 
indicating that Hilda might have some unresolved feelings about her own dad, who has yet to show up in the series so far. What I love about this scene is that it doesn't feel the need to push the issue to the point of potentially straining the viewer's suspension of disbelief for the sake of learning more about Hilda's past. And it still manages to hint at more going on behind the curtains, which is a character-building strategy that I don't think receives enough appreciation. We don't learn about every aspect of people's lives in the real world, and it's incredibly hard and rare for a show to detail every major event in a particular character's life and believably demonstrate how all of that person's experiences shaped them into who they are now, with the same level of depth as what a real person would experience in the real world. As such, much of the time, it might just be better to simply let the audience's mind fill in the gaps. And that feels like an especially fitting way to do character development in Hilda, because it's a series where it feels like we'll never get a complete understanding of the world and all the inhabitants of it. There always might be a new cave we haven't explored, a new mythical species we haven't discovered, and the wonder over the unknowable is a huge part of the appeal of Hilda for me, though I already explained why in more depth in my video analyzing season 1. Of course, it's not like this film is entirely just hinting. There's plenty of more traditional exposition, notably coming from from Trilla as she explains how troll society works, which I've made reference to a couple of times. But those scenes are also engaging because it makes perfect sense for Trilla to be explaining this stuff to Hilda, and because the information being exposited is just really, really interesting. I will never get tired of just sitting down and soaking in a unique fantasy civilization, and that of the trolls is no exception. But for as much praise as I can give Hilda and the Mountain King for being Hilda at its best, that doesn't make it immune to some of the issues that the main series couldn't see to shake. It's no secret that Hilda and Jahana's relationship was one of my favorite aspects of the series, but also one of the aspects that I felt had the most consistent room for improvement. And while this movie has almost entirely resolved the issue I had with it previously, it does still contain possibly the most confusing single writing decision in the entire film. Jahana is outside the city looking for petrified trolls that resemble Hilda, and after realizing that the trolls have bells tied around their noses, she decides to help them by removing bells from every troll she comes across. However, at the end of the scene, the camera pans over to reveal that while doing this, she left Hilda's hat on one of the trolls, thus abandoning her search for her daughter. This is a decision that simply makes no sense. There is no reason that Jahana needed to help the trolls instead of looking for Hilda. She could have easily done both at once. In fact, finding Hilda would actually be easier if you were removing the bells from the trolls you had already checked. I just don't see what this accomplishes. If it's to illustrate that Jahana realizes that it's the right thing to do to help the trolls, trolls, that gets established in more concrete terms in the immediately following scene. And again, that doesn't require that she gets distracted from searching for her lost daughter. This decision does not become plot relevant at all. The only tangible thing that comes of this scene is that later in the film, Hilda picks her hat up from the troll it was left on while they're all stampeding towards Trollberg. So effectively nothing. She just gets it back. And obviously Jahana isn't giving up on her efforts to find Hilda since she goes right back to searching for her immediately after her encounter with Alberg. All it does is make it seem like Jahana doesn't actually care that much about finding Hilda for like a few minutes afterwards, which couldn't have been the intention because this film drops motherly love references in almost every other scene, and well, the entire climax and falling action of the film exists, all of which I find extremely compelling. The other continuing pet peeve I have with Hilda is that of the general treatment of Eric Alberg. In the past, I've expressed that I wanted him to come to terms with his misguided attitude and actions towards the trolls, and exactly that happens in this movie, however, it's only because Hilda just beams the same vision that she and Frida both saw into his head, and this suddenly makes him completely empathize with the trolls. Leaving aside the fact that the vision didn't reveal its meaning to either Hilda or Frida, and thus that Eric shouldn't suddenly understand what the trolls are going through, probably doesn't help that he's a moron. This just feels… cheap. It feels too easy, given the lengths our characters have gone through to clear up much less significant misunderstandings, and given how much more of a presence Alberg and his troll phobia have in this film, it seemed like a more realistic approach should have been taken towards resolving the conflict. But unfortunately, in real life, we don't have a magic orb that we can just dunk people's heads into to make them get over their prejudices. The last notable complaint I have of Hilda and the Mountain King is that it doesn't really give Frida and David anything of importance to do. Naturally, they want to do whatever they can to help get Hilda back, however, in efforts to do so, the film has them act pretty out of character by stealing a spellbook from the library and performing a spell to try and get Hilda back. 
even though Kaisa specifically told them that troll magic and witch magic don't mix. Frida and David are smart enough to know not to go messing around with magic that they don't fully understand, especially when they were told point blank not to mess with it by someone they know and trust. And just like with Hilda's hat, literally nothing comes of this plot point. It's set up like the spell that Frida and David cast was going to come back to bite everyone in the ass, but it literally does nothing. No scene of Kaisa chewing them out for going behind her back, no moment of the witch magic actually having a negative interaction with troll magic, it just amounts to wasted time. I've actually entertained the idea that this spell will come back in the third season somehow, seeing as it's very unlikely for this series to just drop a plotline that looked like it was going somewhere as demonstrated by its impressive continuity which I discussed earlier. I mean, even the Hilda's hat thing acknowledges the initial weird writing decision by showing us Hilda getting her hat back. On the bright side, it's always a pleasure to see Frida continuing to progress her use of magic, now seemingly being able to incorporate it into her everyday life without even needing to whip out a spellbook all the time. And getting to know David's mom is… nice. Ultimately, these are extremely minor complaints in what was otherwise a complete package of a film. There are moments that I would consider to be missed opportunities, but I think that those are by and large instances where I simply had a different idea for what I wanted the show to be than the creators. And when I focus on what is present in Hilda rather than what I wish was present, I find myself realizing that this series accomplished nearly everything it set out to do. It's just consistently good in almost every conceivable aspect, which goes a long way in making it so easily recognized recommendable. And I mean that sincerely, most of the shows that I like and even most of my favorites are not mass appealing. And so I don't often find myself in situations where I can sing their praises in front of an audience that will appreciate it. That's why I really value Hilda for being something which we can all share our enjoyment of. Upon finishing Hilda and the Mountain King and seeing that final frame before the credits, I was struck with such a powerful sense of satisfying conclusivity, since to my knowledge at the time, this was the end of Hilda. And I was okay with that. I was not left yearning for more despite how much I enjoyed the movie. The most pervasive emotion I felt by the end was actually gratitude, simply for the existence of a story that I found so effortless to enjoy. Of course, once I discovered that there will indeed be a third season, it was like learning that there was one more Christmas present under the tree that you had missed. I have no doubt that Season 3 of Hilda will continue its pre-established quality, and since analyzing each new installment of the Hilda adaptations is a thing I do now, I guess, I'll be glad to talk even more about the series when the time comes. Until then, have a nice day, and I'll see you in the next one.